probably not the best idea, and I should have had that conversation with you before, uh, because you, you have a tendency to talk about it, and then that sways your thinking one way or another. These are only effective in any measure by you being brutally honest when you take it. When you, when you sit down and you take it, you go, this is how I really feel. I know how I should feel about this, but this is how I really feel. And put it, put the, this is how I really feel down, because that's the only way that this is going to make any sense for you. The other thing is that uh, you, you have to know a little bit about how to look at these things, too, because many of you will, will rate things very highly because you give them value but it may not be reflective of the spiritual gift that you're given particularly. So that's why I say all of these kind, all kinds of things, and there's two different surveys here, all of these kind of surveys are only to point you in a direction that you need to be looking to serve. And then get in and test the waters. See how that, how that goes. Work alongside somebody that's a seasoned Christian. Uh, Talk with them about that. Find somebody you're comfortable talking to those things about. Because, again, this, this isn't a definitive test. You can go, okay, this is your spiritual gift, and this is your spiritual gift, and you're going to go out of here, and everybody's going to have a gift. No, you may have one gift. You may have three gifts. You may have five gifts. Well, no, you, your gift is not going to be different, but how you apply it may be different in two years. So your, your gifting is not going to change. The gift that you've got is the gift that you were given the day that you were saved or the gifts you were given the day you were saved. But the application of gifts is, can be very different. For instance, a person that has the spiritual gift of evangelism, and we have several that have the spiritual gift of evangelism. Uh, at least that's what the survey tends to indicate. The gift of evangelism, most people think of Billy Graham. And we talked about this when we talked about evangelism. But many times, a person with a spiritual gift of evangelism, their gift is, the application of that gift is one-on-one -on -one with people. And it may be a very low-key, quiet conversation where somebody is just led to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Others like, are going to be like Billy Graham that get out and that they have a forum of 20,000 people a night. But most people that I know with the spiritual gift of evangelism, it's, it's, a, it's a small group or individual kind of gift that's applied. So the application may be very different. A person with the, with the gift of preaching, teaching, we're going to talk about tonight, uh, may be uh, their, their whole gift will be administered within their family, their, their close-knit family. Uh, some will find their gift uh, in, in churches like this, and some will find their gift in churches of 10,000. So that's the application. It doesn't change the gift. So everybody understand what I'm saying? It's just the application of those things. So if you look at the, the if you took your online survey and you looked at it, like Diane just handed me hers coming in, and you see numbers that are kind of compact, they're all close together, you, you have to realize that you're, that you're looking at that each number more sensitively than if somebody had ones and tens in there. You understand what I'm saying? So if you're looking at this and you say, well, everything's kind of compact together uh, or the numbers are w spread out. If somebody has consistently high numbers or consistently low numbers, you have, to, you have to rate that a little differently and you have to realize there's more variable there for for problems uh, with regard to the accuracy of it. If somebody's taking it and they've got some things they've rated with ones and some they've rated with fives or, or however yours was rated, that, that's going to be a more true, probable leading uh, to your spiritual gift. So with that said, does everybody, did anybody have any questions about what I've just said? And I said somebody, some people, like I, I looked at Jane's, and, and Jane uh, has a very high uh, understanding and appreciation for teaching, for example. 
that's going to be an appreciation level, may or may not be a spiritual gift, but it, it is, it is a, it's obvious there's a very high appreciation for that, uh, for that gift. And so you have to look at that and say, okay, is this an appreciation level or is this truly something that I've been gifted with? Again, you're not going to know this till you actually put your foot in the water and say, okay, let's, let's try this on for size. Uh, don't, don't take any of these things as being totally uh, definitive. All right? So before we get into too much of that tonight, I, wanna, I do want to go through the gift of preaching and teaching. Uh, actually, we're going to talk about one particular scripture from Ephesians 4. It happens to be a, a passage, well, actually, I, I love all of Ephesians 4, but it happens to be a passage that talks about spiritual gifts and it starts off, it says he, in verse 11, and he gave apost the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers. I'm going to stop right there. And we've already talked about all of these, but some of you may not have been in all the, the classes we've had. Uh, we talked about apostles. Apostles were people who were personally taught by Christ. Personally taught by Christ. Now, there are, we've talked about this before. There are those in the church today who still give people the name Apostle. It might be Apostle Farron or Apostle somebody. Uh, but, but from a biblical perspective, the Apostles were those who were personally taught by Jesus Christ. Uh, prophets, we talked about prophets, Old Testament prophecy, New Testament prophets. I'm not going to go through these again. And then it says evangelists. We talked about evangelists ex pretty extensively. And then it says the shepherds and teachers. Now you notice I underline the word and there. In the, in the Greek, the, this word for and is the word chi. And chi can mean a number of things, but, but here it's clear by the implication that what chi is doing, sometimes you have two separate things, you'll say this and that. This is Dave and this is Elva, that's two different things. But you might say, uh, this is Dave, and the Seifert's, okay, I'm, that is explaining something more about the first thing. So shepherds and teachers, in the Greek, it's very strong that that is one thing. It, the teachers is explaining what shepherds are, okay? They will always be teachers. Now, you can have shepherding tendencies, and, but you're going you're gonna to have, a, that's one that you will have high appreciation for teachers because you realize that in shepherding, you cannot shepherd effectively without being a teacher. You, 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 you can't minister to somebody as a shepherd without bringing them along and having them grow in, the, their, spiritual, in, in their spiritual condition. And so... Of, of those things, you have apostles, you have prophets, you have evangelists, you have shepherd teachers. Some translations don't even put the and word in there because they think that in the English it's confusing. So they'll be just like shepherd teachers without a comma between. So just understand that, it, that teachers in this case is explaining something about shepherds. All right, let's look at more of the text. <clears throat> and what, the way we're going to approach this tonight is I'm just going to exegete this particular text tonight and that will help us all understand I hope a little bit more about who the the shepherd teachers are and he gave the apostles the prophets evangelists and shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ he gave these and always remember when you see things like the word two or four those kind of words it's giving you a purpose statement after that. So this is, the, this is what he gave, and this is the reason he gave it. So he said, he gave the, sh the shepherd teachers to go do all the work of ministry. Is that what it says? To equip the saints. Who are the saints? Y'all are the saints. It's not just St. Paul and St. Mark. Y'all are the saints. Uh, Protestant theology, every person who knows Jesus Christ is a saint of God. Okay, so you're the saints. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, 
for building up the body of Christ. So the purpose of the, of the pastor teacher or shepherd teacher is to equip the body with the knowledge of God and the skills to go out and, and accomplish the work of ministry. That's the shepherd's job. The saint's job is to learn, apply, and, and go out and do the work of ministry. Now, is that the way it works in most churches? Is it safe to say, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not the way it works in most churches. So the, pur the purpose of the shepherd teacher, the apostles in the times of the apostles, the prophets and the evangelists, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body. So the, the work of ministry also has a purpose statement. It says the work of ministry is for the building up of the body of Christ. Now the work of ministry may go be to minister to other people in the body. It may, it may be to go out and minister to people who don't know the Lord. It may be a combination of those things that, has, that happens. But ultimately what happens is the, the, those that don't know the Lord, some of those will come to know the Lord, and that is building up the body of Christ. And the other, for, build, for the work of ministry within the body, is for healing, spiritual growth, and, and real ministry between individuals. All of the ministry in the church should not be happening by pastors and elders and, and deacons in the church. It should be between people the saints of God, ministering to one another, caring for one another, building one another up, encouraging one another, uh, being there for one another. For one thing, once you get past about five people in the church, the pastor just can't do it all. But he was never obviously designed to do it all, was he? That's not his gift. What's his gift again? To equip the body for ministry. And the, the purpose of that is for the building up of the body of Christ. Okay, verse 13. He's to do this until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, boy, that's, that's pretty lofty goals right there. To do this until we all attain to the unity of the faith. How much dissension have you seen in churches across this nation? I mean, it's, it's rampant. And, and part of the problem is we don't understand that, that the witness of the body is the unity of the body. The unity of the body and the bond of peace, as Ephesians says. That, that is our calling. And the, the unity, is not, unity is not something you do anything for. Some people say, well... I won't, I won't correct a, a, a doctrinal fault that somebody has. Well, no, that's not doing them any favor. But what is helpful is if we're not drawing bows and arrows over the color of the pews. Understand what I'm saying? There's a difference there. When you're talking about an essential of the faith, we need to have that conversation and we need to bring correction to somebody that's, that's outside of the, the essentials of the faith. But when you're talking about a non-essential of the faith, we don't need to be having arguments over those things. We need to have unity in those things. What was it? I, the quote I gave you last week. In the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity, Christian love. That's, that's the standard by which the, the church should be measuring itself. To attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of God. How can we be the church and be Christ followers without a knowledge of God? You can't do it. And how, how, many, how many places that you have ever been really teach the deep things of God? I mean, I've, I've been all over this world in churches all over the world. And I can tell you where I've been that, that it's fairly consistent. You get the deep things of, of God, and that's in Russia right after the wall fell. Those guys that were underground, now they were studying the deep things of God. And they, 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 were, they were scholarly. I mean, picture this. I'm in Russia. I don't speak any Russian. I learned to say hello in Bible. That's the only two things I knew how to say. Um, I did learn to eventually say bathroom. I needed to know where the bathroom was. 
Uh, and I, I also quickly learned in, in Russia that they don't have men's and women's bathrooms, it's just bathrooms. A little uncomfortable for me, but that's the way it was. But, but there, 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 is an, there, there have an understanding of the deep things of God. And I'm having a conversation with a Russian guy through an interpreter talking about the Greek and the translation from the Greek into Russian and Greek into, into uh, English. And we're trying to make sense of the Greek translating from Russian to English. Now, I, it was a confusing conversation, but I don't have many of those conversations in America. I was, I was having it in Russia, and I thought we were going there to, to benefit them, and I learned, as, I learned a whole lot more, I'm sure, than, than they learned from me. No, they were they were lay people. They were uh, they were people that went and sat in sat in, in the underground church every Sunday and listened to the preachers there. I mean, they were very well informed, very well read. Uh, I was impressed. I mean, I was just generally impressed with the Christian community in Russia. Uh, so you come to the to the, to the knowledge of the Son of God. We, we teach the deeper things, and hopefully on Wednesday nights we're going to continue to teach some of the deeper things of God that, that will allow all of us, and, and don't think that I'm excluding myself from this, because as I study for these Wednesday nights, I'm the one that's most blessed. I can just tell you that I'm by far the most blessed of anybody to hear it come out of Wednesday nights. But to learn something of the knowledge of the Son of God and continue to grow in that knowledge of God. And then to bring, bring application to that in our relationship with God. You know, we talked a lot about relationship last Sunday morning. It is this whole thing of grace is about relationship with God. But if you don't know God, how can you have relationship with him? How, how can you understand what the word of God is saying if you don't know even who he is? So that's why I keep coming back to that over and over. And the scriptures clearly mandate it. To mature manhood, to the maturity of the faith. Not just, not just pablum Christians, but to the meat stuff, the meaty stuff of God. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now there's your, your lofty goal. That we would all be so close to God that we would be following Christ so purely and so wholly and so completely that we're, we're, we're measuring ourselves. I'm measuring myself not by the stature of Jim, but by the stature of Christ. That will encourage me on. If I'm measuring myself to the guy that lives in the trailer next to me down there at Benbow, I'm probably not going to be encouraged on very much. But if I'm measuring myself by the stature of Christ, I'm encouraged to, to continue growing on. Verse 14. So that, there's another one of those purpose statements. This, this whole passage is full of purpose statements. You get What it does is it grows. It gives you this and it says, I'm giving you this so that you'll do this. And I'm giving you these two things so that you'll see this. And I'm giving you all three of these things so that you see how it's growing? you got this growing thing that's happening. Verse 14, so that we may no longer be children, immature, so we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves of, and carried about by every wind of doctrine. That's what that book does that you're talking about. It takes immature Christians, it takes, it takes immature Christians, and it, 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 it expounds on some things that sound really super spiritual, and it carries you into heresy. And, and what happens when immature Christians read stuff like that, they get carried away by every wind of doctrine down very difficult and very bad places. And they come to believe God is somebody he's not. And that's the danger of those things. By every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, there's a lot of craftiness going on out there, and don't think that the enemy won't use somebody that you think a lot of. And don't think that they won't be used. They can be. And we, we must all be on guard for that. By human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. It's not just the spiritual devil that is doing that, but he'll work through people and sometimes even people within the walls of the church. May even be on the membership roll. You really need to be 
super careful. I mean, one of the things I, I told you about before, we had we started a little church there in Denver, North Carolina, and this the guy came and joined the church, and when he walked in, everybody knew who he was. And I went, I don't know who that is, but everybody was going, <gasps> there was whispering going on. I mean, it was, and he was a big time uh, race car owner who used to work in the pits and was a was a was one of the I forget what his title was, but he was the manager over the pits for some of the race car drivers, and everybody knew who he was. But he was a brand new baby Christian, and he told me ten years after the fact. He said the worst thing that church ever did for me is I I came there and within the first six months I was a deacon in that church. That's not the right way. What does the scripture tell us? Be careful who you lay hands on and pray over and, have, and, and bring into the leadership of the body because there can be very difficult things and, and they may not mean anything evil by it. You understand? They may have nothing but the best intentions but be used of the enemy. Verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Speaking the truth in love. Here is, here is a thing that, that often does not happen. Some people will speak the truth, but they speak it in arrogance. And people get offended. And the, even if it is absolutely the truth, they don't have any, any inclination to follow that truth because they were offended by it. So you speak the truth in love. What does 1 Peter 3.15 say? Be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks and do it with gentleness and respect. It is this, this sense of the, the very nature of Christ bringing people into the body and helping them grow in their spiritual condition, being, getting closer to the Lord. Uh, the truth in love. When you came in and said something about the book that you were given, you don't know anything about it, I could have gone, oh, that's nice. You know, and, and just go, go, go off and read it. But, you know, it, it's, a, it's a dangerous thing not not to speak the truth in love. And, and if, I, if I do care about you at all, I'm going to tell you what I know can be very dangerous to head down. But I've got to do that in such a way that you know that I'm doing that only because I care. And I don't want you headed there. So that's, that's speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way. The word grow up there is exactly that. It's, if what he's, Paul is saying is grow up. Don't sit in the same place spiritually. Read some really good stuff. Learn some more about God. Ask lots of questions. That's why I wanted to compliment the, the kids Sunday morning. You know, they're asking questions. One of the dangers of growing up is we quit asking questions. Well, I might look stupid if I ask that question. A child just goes, hey, you know, I got a question. When I first got to seminary, uh, you know, my very first class, I'm sitting there, and Dr. Geisler comes in to introduce the guy that's going to be teaching the class, and he's introducing him, and I'm going, I got a question, and, I'm, and I ask a question, and, and he answers it, and, then I, and a little bit later, before he got him introduced, I went, I got another question. I mean, this is my very first class. I don't know anything. And so I'm asking questions, and a little bit later, he goes, you trying to be smart with me? And I'm going, no, I'm really that stupid. I wanted to ask a question. You know, just, just help me understand. I, we need, all need to be like little children with regard to asking questions. We need to be ready to, uh, to hear the answers and make, bring application to our life. Every way into him who is the head, into Christ. It is Christ that is leading. If, if we are the church, and we really are the church, we're not just a building on a corner in, in Redway, California. If we're really part of the church universal, Christ is our head. And, and nothing I should ever say or nothing anybody ever says within the walls of this church should ever come into contradiction with what Christ says, nor should it carry us in a different direction than what Christ is leading. If we, if we sit down as the leadership of this church and we pray over things and we, we, go, we believe God is leading us in this particular direction, then we should all come together around that. You know, we should all be part of, of the moving forward. But it's Christ leading. If Christ shows us we're wrong, we need to be the first ones to step up and say, we were wrong. We, just, we, we interpreted that wrong. And let, now we need, we, we, we've, 
we learn something out of it, we're ready to make a change in direction. So, but always Christ is the head. From whom, that is Christ, the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. The body is equipped with every one of you. Every one of you have the spiritual gifts. Every one of you do. Where the church get, starts to fail is where the pastor starts stepping up and doing things that need to be done in the body that he is not equipped to do. He is not gifted to do. I'll give you an example. We were in Colorado, and some things happened in the church, and we had a flood, and it flooded the whole place, and all our pews were ruined, and it was, it was a nasty mess. Uh, just came down through the ceiling, absolutely wiped out everything in the church. Went down through the, the main floor into the basement and wiped everything out down there. So we call the insurance company. They say, okay, the first thing you got to do is you got to get all the carpet and everything out of there because by the time we get there, all that's going to be mildewed and just cause you more problems. So you need to get that out of there. Guess who took the carpet out of there? Me and one other guy. You, now, I can tell you, two, two of the best guys in the world with carpet didn't need to be trying to roll up that heavy, wet mess and try to get it out of there. It was, it was disaster. But we had guys that were part of not our church, but part of the church body that were local, that that's what they did. They, they knew how to do that. But nobody would bring them in because there was this little thing going on between people in our church and people in their church. That's why the unity of the body. I mean, we need to be building up, encouraging one another, coming alongside of one another as best we can to serve God. The whole body is held together by Christ. The book of Hebrews, it says that even the universe is being sustained and held together by Christ himself. Now, it's an interesting thing that scientists today that are, that are looking at the Big Bang and what all happened during that time will tell you a couple of things. One, there was something that happened right after the Big Bang that they call a tweak. They, they say, they laughingly say the hand of God tweaked it right after the, the Big Bang. There's, there's this anomaly that took place. The second thing is that, it, that during, at the Big Bang, they can't figure out now, knowing what they know about it, why everything hadn't flown off all, all apart in the universe, just completely expanded and, and exploded out into space. And the book of Hebrews answers that because Jesus Christ is holding all of that together and sustaining it. But they, they can't explain it from a, from a scientific point of view. Why did it not just explode out of existence? There's, this, there's, a, there's a whole lot of controversy within the scientific community today. Um, but it's, it's Christ that holds all this together. He holds together the body of Christ in the same way. It is he that sustains it, he that has gifted each one of us, and he that has a direction for every single church. Our church may have a totally different direction than another church in this community, but it's for the purpose of the unity of the body of Christ and for God's glory to be manifested through the, the combination of the work being done. It may be totally different. doesn't mean that both of them are, are right or both of them are wrong. It's just they're different, and God has a plan for each one. Each part is to be working properly. It has to do its part. It makes the body grow so that it builds up itself in love. Love is that core value that holds the body together. I, I t I'm going to talk about it again Sunday morning. I talked a lot about it this past Sunday. That that word agape is more than just a tiny word that you can study one time and figure out. I can tell you, you could study that one word for a lifetime, and you could every day you study it, you'll draw closer to God, and you'll be amazed at all that's there. And how those such different things can be held together by this one word. How it can be totally independent of any reciprocation. And somebody says, I, well, how do you love somebody? I fell out of love with somebody. You don't fall out of agape with anybody because agape is a decision you make. You may have an emotional response to agape down the road, 
but the decision you make doesn't change whether you get that love is reciprocated or whether you ever have that emotional feeling. It's rooted in the decision, and all of us ought to be very, very, very thankful that that's the way God loves us because he could look at me every day and go, he doesn't deserve my love today. Or I fell out of love with Dave Seifert. <coughs> but he doesn't do that because he chose to love me. He decided to love me. And he, that is the way we're commanded to love one another. So this building of it, up of itself in love, that, that love that is the agape, if we ever would get a handle on it, it is, it's like the soil and the seed and the fertilize and everything to do with the growth of, the, of a healthy body. Everything is in that. That one word. Now, there's a whole lot more to God than love. He also is just, and he, he demands justice. Uh, he, he's gentle, but he can, be, he can be absolutely harsh over what's right. And, and all of that is, but it is the core of that, the, the very basic a root of who God is is measured in that agape love. And this body is to grow so that it builds itself up in that same love. That word right there is agape. It builds itself up in that same love. Any other love applied, let me, let me be stronger, any other love applied in the body of Christ without agape will fail because it's dependent on reciprocation. Every other form of love there is described in the Bible. There are three other types of love described in the Bible. Every one of them are dependent upon some kind of reciprocation or some value being given to that person being worthy of love. This word doesn't have any of that in it. So it's measured greatly by what it doesn't have in it. It doesn't have any of those reciprocal values or the need for somebody to love you back or to take care of you or to give you something. If the body grows that way because of this, uh, this kind of agape love within the body, then the little things people say or do are not going to affect you that much. I mean, if it's, if it's just a little thing that's a non-essential in the body, I, I've, I've tr started really trying hard to remember this very lesson when somebody that, uh, that normally in my flesh would just tick me off. Because that, that, do, that has no bearing on how I love them. By definition of the very word. It has no bearing. Whether I like it or not. Whether, whether our personalities gel or not. Or whether you know, I feel good about them or not. Whether I like what they did or not. It doesn't make any difference. I'm still commanded to love them that way. John, you had a thought? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of both. Uh, the, lots of controversy in the church community today because of the whole church growth movement that's focused so much in numbers. You can have very, in my estimation, very unhealthy growth in the body if all you're focused on is numbers. Because you can do all kinds of things. I mean, there, there's churches that have wrestling matches on Sunday morning to get people in the door. Uh, really, they, they have wrestling matches, tag, tag team, CF, whatever it is, you know, Christian World Federation, something, you know. And, and you think, you laugh, but that's actually happening. It's actually happening. There's all kinds of ways. You can, you can hire really great bands and have light shows and fog machines and do all kinds of stuff to get people in the door. It, that, I think the numbers are to be there, but that, that is after the spiritual growth takes place. That is healthy growth. When, when a person's growing spiritually, I, I believe a couple of things happen. You become concerned about other people's souls. They may not appreciate you being concerned about their soul, but agape overcomes that. Filio love will not. Eros love will not. Storge love will not. But agape overcomes that. And it says that I'm concerned for that person's soul. And we begin to realize we put a great value on that, that uh, amagadei is the, the Latin.
that every single individual that is, that is on the face of this earth is created in the image of God, the Imago Dei. They, that that is, is, gives them value. It makes every person valuable, and their soul is valuable. And if I understand that correctly, then this building up in love makes me concerned for them, regardless of how unattractive they were. Now, Jim and I went down to some of the homeless camps on Tuesday and just hung out with some people there. And, and, and most of them are not terribly attractive. Some of them smell terribly bad. Uh, the, the issue of drugs is obvious. The sanitation is horrible. But I'm not, I'm not commanded to love where they live. I'm commanded to love and care for them and, and be concerned about their soul. And so next Tuesday, we've got a Bible study set up down there. I said, just, just in, invite whoever you want to come. We're going to have a Bible study on the river down here behind Renner's. You know? That's, that's because, not because I like the environment. It's not because they were nice to me, because some of them weren't. Uh, it's not because they all had uh, wonderful mouths about them, because they didn't. It wasn't because they weren't all drugged up, because they were. Uh, none of those things are, are measured within that word agape. But, but true spiritual growth, I believe, has to happen in the body of Christ before mature, healthy, numerical growth comes on. It's the reason a lot of times people get really discouraged in a church. Because you say somebody like me, a new pastor comes in and go, okay, uh, people are curious, they're going to come. But then there's a, there's a point in time that, that the curiosity goes away. And you begin to say, okay, you're going to have some people that are genuinely interested in growing in the Lord, and they're going to come hang in there. And because they're genuinely interested, they're going to talk to other people. And going to bring some people in, like the little girls I described to you before that came in, three little sisters, and they came in about half dressed and put their, their feet up on the back of the pews, and I mean barefooted, uh, dirty feet on the back of the pews while I'm preaching. And people were going nuts in our congregation. And I'm going, those are little souls. They happen to, those little children happen to live in a home of the, of the number one meth distributor in the four state area. But they need to know Jesus. And we had some people very upset that those, that those little children were there. But every one of those over a period of four years, eventually, one by one by one, came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. And they could, they could teach a lot of us because they've been through some stuff. So that, that I, I remember I got a picture made with a little girl in Africa. I guess, guess it was the second year we were over there, maybe the third. And, and I remember holding her in front of me. I was, I was squatted down, and I had my hands around her waist little tiny girl, and she had on a, a Mickey Mouse t-shirt that was absolutely filthy and ripped open in the front, big gashes open in the front. And I could, I could still close my eyes and, and smell that smell. I mean, it was, a, it was a smell of death on that little girl. She had a horrible odor. But she couldn't have been more loving and desirous to know things of Jesus than, than she was. I've never had any a child or adult that wanted to know Christ more than that little girl did. And I still remember standing. I've got that. I've got that picture. Um, I still remember squatted down, holding that little girl, and thinking, "This little girl is not terribly attractive to anyone. She smells horrible, but she's got a little soul that needs to know Jesus." And agape love says that's the building up of the body. Sometimes it's not very attractive. Sometimes it's not, it's not, it doesn't even look very fruitful on the bottom line of the financial statement. In fact, it looks like a drain. But that's the building up of the body. So from whom, that is Christ, the whole body is joined together and held together by every joint which it is equipped. You are the equipping of the body. Every one of you have a gift here. You are the equipping of that body. It grows the body, first spiritually, I believe that in a healthy way, then numerically begins to happen behind that if it's healthy growth. 
If you switch that around and you could, you'll do anything to get people in the door, you'll see as many, the, the fastest growing church in America is in Texas. They also are the fastest, have the, the largest number of people leaving and not ever coming back every Sunday. They're coming in the front door, going out the back door. They're coming in huge because of the notoriety. But they're, they have more going out the back door statistically than they've got coming in the front door. And that's been consistent for about the past 14, 15 months. That is not healthy growth. You know, up until about 14, 15 months ago, it was, the numbers were increasing every, every, every Sunday, but there were, there were, they would have 2,000 come in the front door that were new and 1,500 go out the back door. Why was that? Because none of this was applicable. None of this was real in that church, but, but it was spectacular. And the message was real popular because there's no challenge in the message. Don't even have to know Jesus to get saved. That's true. So it, it, was, it was a very popular message. So that, that's, anybody got any questions about Ephesians 4? We've, we've done 11 to 16. That's, that's, that's the message of the, the equipping of the body, which is the, the responsibility of the shepherd teacher. So that's the last one of these we're going to do. There are other gifts we haven't talked about, but I think this, this covers the vast majority of them. Okay? Any thoughts or questions there? If we don't get this, if we don't understand that, I mean, my role in this body is no more important than anybody else is sitting here. And that's why if, if you don't come in and perform what God has gifted you to do in this body, the body will always be missing something. It, it'll be limping along. We were up at Kenny's house this, this last week, and we, we went out there and saw a machine that he's put, built to, over the last 30 years. It's got eight wheels on it. Every wheel is independent of one another, and they crawl independent, and the, there's hydraulics everywhere. And I'm just trying to follow all the hydraulic lines, seeing where all this stuff goes. I wouldn't have a clue. I mean... Before I went out there, I asked him if I could drive it, and he said no. <laughs> when I got there, I understood why, because there was no way I could drive that thing. It, ha it had stuff going everywhere. But if you take out one hydraulic line, it's not going to function properly. Just one. I mean, it looked like to me there was hundreds of them in there. But if you just take out one, it's not going to function. It's not going to do what it was designed to do. And that's the way the body of Christ is. I mean, you go out there to, well, my old truck's not out there. My old, my old truck I normally drive uh, to the church. And you go out there and you take one screw out of the carburetor, it ain't going to start. You take the right screw out, it's not going to start. It's just one screw. Just one. That's the body of Christ. Every part it must do its part according to that text. Every part doing its part in order to be healthy and to see spiritual growth take place and then numerical growth come behind that and take place. If that's not happening and the body fails, it's, it may be that every, every person, 80% of the people in the church are doing what God's called them to do and one's not. And the whole thing can fall. And it's just like I, I said about that little girl in Africa. I mean, even as I was holding her, I remember thinking, this little thing is not very lovely. You know, if I would take her back home, she would not be accepted in the church that sent me there. And that's a sad reality. But that's, that's, that's the reality of, of where we are. Why? Because she, was, she, she not only wasn't very lovely, she, she was just downright hard to be around. Not because of her sweet little personality, but because she just was, she had such a foul odor, because her clothes were, were ripped and torn, because she, you know, she had part of one shoe on and not another shoe on, and, 
and you look at her and you try to get close, and I couldn't get as far as from here to Kenny without smelling her. She had a little soul. And so, yeah, we're to, I believe we're to, we're, we're to hang in there and try to get a hold of what it is that God's got that person there for. Maybe they're, there to, they're just there to hear about Jesus the first time. You know, that, that little girl. I had another lady with, two, uh, with one infant and one toddler that walked three days and three nights to hear me preach. Now, she didn't know me, but she heard somebody was going to be talking about Jesus. And she wasn't very attractive when she got there. I mean, she got there and she'd been walking three days and three nights without a bath, without, any, without a lot of food. She had some water, but not a lot of food. And, but she just wanted to hear about Jesus. And we have a hard time get, gathering a crowd on a Wednesday night. That, that's why I'm as passionate about a lot of this stuff as I am, because I've seen people that are hungry, that, that desperately desire it. And, but this is, this is the way that this is. A lot of times, you know, uh, th there was a reason for that stock car owner to be there at that church. It wasn't what everybody thought, but there was a reason for him to be there. He got saved in that church. We just needed to treat it differently than we did. And it was a lot of our fault. So that's where we are. Let's talk about your spiritual gifts in that last 10 or 15 minutes here. And I brought something with me tonight. I'm not going to tell you what this is, but I'm going to hold it up and I'm going to explain what it is Sunday morning other than it's a knife. And it has to do with the sermon last week and the sermon this coming week. So I'm, not going to, I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm not going to ask you to tell me what it is, but we're going to talk about that Sunday morning. Okay, so your gifts. The, uh, some of you rated very high in the gift of mercy. Uh, let me talk about those that I had, I graded that did not go online and do this. Um, Beth rated very high in the gift of mercy. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a reason that you're there. You're using using gifts. So. Um, Kevin. Um, very high in in, uh, in evangelism. So we're going to get you out on the field. We're going to test the waters with that. Praise the Lord. Fair and the same thing. Evangelism. Very high on evangelism. Um, so I'm encouraged. I've, I've been in some very large churches where I only had one or two people that had the spiritual gift of evangelism. So I'm anxious to see to go out and test the waters with you guys. Now let me, now that I've said just that much, let me add something to what I've already said about spiritual gifts. Because you have the spiritual gift does not necessarily mean you have all the skills that you need to make bring application to that gift. Does that, do you understand what I'm saying? You have the inclination, you understand the need, you understand, for instance, in evangelism, that those are souls of real people, and that's a high value to God. And, and because of that, you place, you place a value there. It does mean that you will, you will have an inclination toward picking up the, the the talents and the skills and the and be a part of the activity that you can make that effective if indeed these are, are reflective of those those gifts and we're there's only one way to find out and that's go out and test the waters go out and work come alongside as somebody that has the gift I don't have the gift of evangelism but I've done a good bit of evangelism so I'm, I'm always thrilled to go out and say okay I don't have that gift but what, what that means is if you'll develop the skills you'll quickly become better at it than I because I don't have the gift, but, I, but I've done it enough that I, I'm, I do have some of the skills of, and I know how to talk to people about these particular issues. Um, Jane has the gift of helps, which I, I've just, I, I would have guessed that pretty clearly. Uh, I think that's probably a very accurate estimate of, 
of your gifting. A uh, person with a gift of helps sees the needs and fills the potholes. Makes everything run smoother in the church. There's things that need to be done. This past month, Baron and Jane cleaned the church. Uh, they didn't just clean the church, they sanitized the church. I mean, they got the job done. But, that, but, but the person with the gift of help sees there's a need, and they fill the need. Also, Jane's working in the library because she sees that, that I'm very excited about talking about tools that you can use to grow closer to God and how effective that can be if we know just how to find exactly the book that I'm wanting to hand to somebody and how to go in there and, and search. And we'll, we're going to be talking more about that as it gets closer to completion. So those are our gifts that uh, some of you have. Beth, you also rate pretty highly in evangelism. So uh, you know, get out there and work on that. And uh, so here, here's an example with Farron's that is, is, is pretty clear because Farron did have things he rated as ones. He had things he rated as twos. He also had things he rated as fours and fives. That, that was the scale on this particular survey, one to fives. So he has scores all over the board for these different gifts, and it's very clear evangelism jumps out. So I can, I can see that more clearly than, for instance, in Kevin's, who are, his scores are more jammed together, but it is clear that, that there's a, at least uh, a strong understanding of the value of evangelism there. Um, Diane, you're one of the two that, that has scores spread out pretty far, and you're it appears that your gift of mercy jumps off the charts. So it's strong, very strong in the gift of mercy. Very much needed in the body of Christ. The problem with, with I'll, I'll just tell you this on the front end, the problem with mercies is quite often they don't employ their gift because they don't see it as as valuable as other gifts. Very, very valuable in the body of Christ that people who are there to come alongside of other people that, that have an empathy, not just sympathy, but empathy for people and can come along and, and help them through particular situations. Draw close to individuals and help them through. Get counsel as to how to help them through, but to help them through. Uh, David and Carol aren't here tonight, but I've got theirs here. And um, as some of you might guess, David Ordonis, uh, his clear area of, uh, of a high scores in the administration area. Uh, and Carol, Carol very high in mercy as well. There's a person to team with and to help come alongside. See, this is why this, is, this is, can be very valuable because you learn people that have some of the same gifts. You can, you can, you can tag team to, to help and, and talk about how to help individuals through. Uh, so that, that just give you an indication. That's the only ones I've got the test on back before tonight. I did get uh, Jim and Chris is here as they came in the door tonight, but I haven't obviously had time to sit down and put that together, but I will. Uh, the gifts of the body. Does anybody have any questions about any of the gifts? I mean, we've been over all of these we've talked about tonight, but. I think it's really important that you appreciate one another's gifts. Now, you know, Elva has a gift of mercy, but she, she also has a, a gift of, of teaching, and her teaching ability with other women it also attributes to the, the success in mercy because you can't just have empathy for somebody. If you genuinely have the gift of mercy, it's not just about empathy and going poor, poor, pitiful you. It's how can I help you through this process? Uh, and both of you with the life experiences that you have are gonna be much more valuable than say somebody like me to be able to come alongside somebody and help them through. Critical stuff. Uh, if you haven't got your surveys back to me, please get them to me. They're valuable to me. 
because I, I, I need to understand where the gifts are. Well, well I can fix that. <laughs> no, <laughs> I hope it's a little better than that. Does any, do, do all of you see how some of these things begin to fit together? How the body functions with all of these pieces and parts? And it's just like gears in a machine, you know. It, it, it all works like this. And, and every part has its part, as the scripture says. Every part has its function. It takes all of it to make it work. And if you leave one out, it stops right there. It does, there's not a full functioning of the body. You, you, you need all of these. Let me just go through the ones we've got down here again. Administration. We, we need administer, administers. You know, people that can administer the body from, from a financial standpoint, from a facility standpoint, from from. I mean, we're getting ready to step out and do some things with this apologetics ministry in about October or November this year that are going to call on us all to do different things, use different applications of your gifts than you may have ever used before. You're going to use the same gift, different application. But, it'll, but it, all of that needs to function. And if we don't have all the cogs to make it function well, it's not going to function very well. It's not going to be pretty. Uh, you know, if somebody's interested in, in going, you guys with the gift of evangelism, if you're available to go next Tuesday, go down to the riverfront with me. Everybody down there that I talked to, of course, when they found out I was a preacher, I mean, that's, you know, suddenly all of them were saved already. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, didn't, they didn't talk like they were saved, but they were all, you know, they're all, yeah, they all know Jesus now. But, see, that's where somebody with the gift of evangelism, your, your sense of those people, for a couple reasons, number one, you've been here a while, and you have a sense of the community, but your sense of, of the true need for evangelism will be keener by definition of the fact, if, you, if indeed you have the gift of evangelism, Kevin and Farron, than mine will be. You will have a better sense of that than I will, because that's your gift. You understand what I'm saying? That, 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 that you're just going to have a better inclination of what that's really all about. But we're, we're, going, to have, we're going to have a Bible study, and that, that means I'm, the first thing I'm going to do when I go in there is lay down some laws. This is, this is the way that this study is going to go, and, this is, and, and I'll put up with these things. I won't put up with these things over here. And if you want to be a part of that, I'm, I'm, I'll embrace you, and I'll, you know, I'll come in if you're stoned, and we'll still have a Bible study. But uh, I'm told I'll be down there around 11 o'clock. So. Now, I will say this. At this point, I would not encourage any women to go down there. Just, just from what I've experienced so far. I've only spent about a half hour down there, but I, I, I just wouldn't. Uh, now, there may come a point in time that because we did run into some women up on Hippie Hill, but uh, does, do you not know where Hippie Hill is? That's the name of the hill. And I knew that the first week I was here. Uh, but there was, some, there was some women up there, and they definitely need some, but down the river, those were mostly all men, and that was, that was a pretty rough group. So we can go down there and maybe make a difference. That's, that's the inclination there, is for those of you with evangelism. People with encouragement, you need to be encouraging one another. As you see people using their spiritual gifts, encourage them in those gifts. And even if you don't have the spiritual gift of encouragement, come alongside somebody and, and let them know you see God working in them in, the, in using the gifts that they're using. Tell them. I mean, I think we're just hesitant to tell people how much we appreciate what God's doing in them. And it's encouraging to them just to be able to know that somebody sees that. Just let them know. The gift of faith. Some of you have very high scores in the gift of faith. Farron, you had a very high score in the gift of faith. Um, Jane, you had a very high score in the gift of faith. Um, Kevin, also. 
Uh, so you know, these are these are just like I say, they're kind of sketches that just will help you point your direction you need to be looking to serve within the body. Uh, Farron also scores very high and helps. So the things that you've been doing around here should bring you some fulfillment in that. But you've got an interesting combination of helps and evangelism, and that can be very effective on the field when you're really talking to people uh, and seeing what the needs are. How, those, how these gifts come together in each individual, if you're interested in sitting down and just chatting about your particular survey and how several of those gifts can come together, because just I look at Ferentz and I see, uh, you know, I see four potential spiritual gifts that just jump off the page. But every person, personality, and the, the individual gifts that you're given will come together in a particular way to serve God in a uni totally unique way of anybody else on the face of the earth. But he has placed you in this body to perform a function there. And every, every single person is going to find that you have some areas that, you, that are just higher than others, but, but how those come together to function is always very interesting to me. To see somebody with the gift of, of helps, uh, and the gift of evangelism side by side, that excites me. I get excited about the potential for what God can do with that combination of gifts. But I would, I would encourage you to do that. Take the spiritual gift survey, set a time that we can sit down together. Ladies, I'll have Elva sit in with us, uh, but, and she can give a lot of inclination as to what she's experienced over the years as we've done this. The other thing that, I, that I've seen with this is that it will bring some of you together with people. You'll draw you closer to some people in this church that maybe you don't even know well at this point. You know their face, but you don't even maybe you don't even know their name. And that's part that's part of a healthy body as well, as we're beginning to see. Okay, this is how we're meant to function. Our personalities haven't brought us together, but our gifts should. So that's a, that makes for a healthy body. Okay. That's all that I got so far. That's all the comments I'm going to make on those. I will say this tonight. One of the, our little children that desperately wants to go to camp uh, came to me Sunday morning, and she'd been asking me about camp. And she said to me, Pastor, if I, if I give you a trillion dollars, can I go to camp? And I just kind of flippantly said, yes, that'd be fine. Give me a trillion dollars. I'll definitely send you to camp. So she brought me a trillion dollars. Uh, I got a trillion dollar bill here, and it's got a great gospel message on the back of it. So I'm going to figure out how to get her to camp this year, and um, we'll, we'll get that worked out for her. But I just thought that was cute. thought I'd share that story with you. If I bring you a trillion dollars, can I go to camp? Yes, sir. Gab, like Gabby? The gift of Gab? You think you want the gift of gift? Uh, I've known some people with the gift of honoriness. <laughs> now, Kenny was nice to me this week. David and I went up there and we drove go karts and we did all kinds of fun stuff. I'm still wanting to let me get in that fishing pond up there for those trout are. I, that, that was pretty exciting to me. <laughs> All right. Huh? Is it? <laughs> Is that what those ducks are out there for? <laughs> All right. Spiritual gifts. Any other questions, thoughts, ideas? Okay. Spiritual gifts, different than application. Application of gifts may be very different across the board. Uh, you can have one gift and 200 applications to that gift. Don't, don't, don't hem yourself in a corner of your service by the name of your gift. Look for the ways to administer that gift and to apply those gifts in your life. And you're going to see doors open to serve God. We're going to talk about this whole idea of ministry, that word is in our scripture text for Sunday morning. And what is ministry? It is servanthood love. It is learning to serve with love. That's what ministry is. And 
ministry should never be confused with church programs. They can be very different things. But your ministry will be what will come through the applications that you find for your spiritual gift. Gift of mercy, there are literally thousands of applications for the gift of mercy. Encouragement, very rare in a body of Christ. You find one person with the gift of encouragement, that person can light a whole church up. Uh, just very, very clearly. Uh, you haven't taken it this time. I'm interested to see what, what yours is. I've taken both of the ones that, that I gave you. Mine came out very close to the same thing on both, both of the surveys. So both of these should be fairly good in the way of leading you on. Anybody else? You have something? Okay. All right, next Wednesday night, we're going back to heaven. Going back to heaven. Going back to heaven. <laughs> We'll be there for probably another five or five or <laughs> as hot as it was today. I'm glad to know we're headed that way. <laughs> but uh, we'll be there for about five or six weeks, and then we're going to take some time to uh, to start looking at some of these apologetic issues to, to build toward October when we start dealing with more of the apologetics. Uh, also, Tom's going to be gone. Some in August on vacation, he and Nancy are going to uh, take off and go celebrate their 50th anniversary, which I think is very helpful and good. So I'll be taking a couple of those Sunday mornings to deal with some apologetic issues as well. So, let me see. I'm going to close this out in prayer, but if anybody has a, a prayer that you would like to lift up when I get through... I'm going to open up the floor, and then uh, I'll close this out at the end, okay? Father God.